And so welcome everyone. This is intro, uh, int um, this is Understanding Your Dog with Phil Klein, a certified dog listener. Tonight, Phil is going to help us learn to speak the language of canines. Um, he'll go over the four key drivers of canine behavior. And he's going to help us transform our dog's behavior in a kind and lasting way by using simple dog friendly practices. Um, so you're encouraged to ask questions about your own personal pet that's in your house um, because this is a program where this is entirely um, necessary because we need to have all those examples coming in. Um, so a little bit more about Phil Klein. His path to becoming a dog listener started when his family rescued a special dog named Abby from Labs for Rescue. And at that time, he had no idea about the journey he would be privileged to take with Abby. So her behavioral challenges were the motivation for Phil to learn a lot more about dogs and to find a way to help Abby overcome her fears. And in the process, Phil discovered Jan Fennell. And I don't know if any of you have ever heard of Jan Fennell, but she is the original dog listener. And she's written several books about dog listening. She developed a revolutionary methodology for training dogs based on their instincts. And so in April 2009, Phil attended Jan Fennell's foundation and advanced canine communications courses and became a certified dog listener. And he works through in-home consultations. He volunteers with Labs for Rescue and other rescue organizations. And he also gives these public talks. He's been honored to help thousands of dog owners and their dogs, and he's really easy to reach and really helpful if you call or um, look him up online. He's always available to um, to talk. And um, uh, for those of you who don't have it, it's PhilTheDogListener.com. So that's one way to get in touch with Phil. So I hope most of you received in advance the handouts that Phil um, shared with me, and then I turned them over to you via an email distribution. Um, and uh, you don't have to have them tonight, but they certainly would help. And uh, Phil's going to be talking all about all this, all about those key points. And uh, without any further ado, I'd like to turn the program over to Phil Klein. So welcome, Phil. It's nice to have you. Thank you very much, Holly, and thank all of you for coming. I love doing these uh, talks. And um, just so you're aware of it, we're you know we've got now less than 90 minutes to cover about four hours of material. We're not gonna to try to cover all four hours of material. So I'm, you know, I'm not gonna go into some of the details I normally would, but as advertised, we will talk about key behavioral factors. Uh, uh, behavior is all about conversations. In other words, how do we um, maybe cause some behavioral challenges with our dogs? And uh, we'll get into the solutions. So th this is really about understanding your dog, how it thinks, what makes it tick, so you know why it behaves as it does, and then what can you do to um, eliminate behavioral challenges that you that you would like to like to eliminate, and to do all that in a uh, kind way. Okay, so we're gonna. I'm just gonna jump right into it. Um, and most of this is going to be spent on, our time is going to be spent on sharing information with you. But I understand you're not here to listen to me to market to you, okay? So we're going to, we're going to get right to the meat. All righty. Key what are the key behavioral factors that drive canine behavior? First of all, they're instincts that they inherited from the wolf. And if you don't think dogs came from wolves, think again. Okay, because regardless of what a dog looks like, wolves and dogs share 99.7% of their DNA in common. So what does that mean, you know, in terms we can understand? You can mate a dog with a wolf and start a new bloodline. That's how close their DNA is. In fact, dogs, uh, wolves, and coyotes interbreed. That's how close their DNA is. Um, Eastern coyotes, the percentages might have changed, but the ones we have in Connecticut are 64% coyote, 26% wolf, and 10% dog. All right, so I'll, I'll jump off of that. Okay, now what are these instincts? 
the primary instincts are that a dog wants to be part of a pack just like a wolf. Uh, it needs to know where it fits in the pack and it has to have at least one lead. Leader. Uh, so that's why in our world, a world that dogs don't understand, sometimes they become the leaders because we don't interact in ways that demonstrate to our dogs that we are capable of being leaders. Okay. And by the way, a pack can be just two people, you and your dog, or it could be a mix of people and dogs. And regardless of how many people are in the pack, you are part of the pack, okay? So um, now, okay, so what? So instincts are, are very important and, and you know, what the primary thing is, knowing how, how does a dog figure out where, is it, where it fits in the pack? What does it do, okay? We're gonna get to that. Second very important factor is its personality. What kind of personality does a dog have? Does it have a personality that's well suited to being a leader? Like, you know, that's, that's, a, that's assertive, that's calm, it's confident, it's decisive. It, it wants to be a leader. Or does it have a personality that's not suitable for leadership, which would be anxious, fearful, uh, high strung, introverted. And a lot of our dogs don't have the personalities to be leaders. In fact, I would hazard a guess that 70 or 80% of them don't have the personalities to be leaders. They wouldn't be a leader in the wild. If, the, if a, wolf, a wolf would not be a leader in the wolf pack if it had a personality like most of our dogs. So we got a dog that has this big scary job of leadership if you have inadvertently turned leadership over to it in a world it doesn't understand, okay? And that big scary job is just like a leader in the wild would be, whether it's a wolf pack, coyotes, uh, dingoes, African wild dogs. So basically, I don't wanna humanize dogs, but essentially, because we're pack animals and they're pack animals, it's kind of like being parents. The leaders in the wolf pack used to be called alphas, but that kind of connotes the wrong uh, in, uh, uh, image of them. Um, but they are responsible for the survival of the pack. And the same goes if our dogs are at the top of the pecking order. So we've got those first two factors, key factors, environment, where you live, the sights, the sounds, the smells, um, the territory the dog occupies, which of course includes your yard or actually anywhere you walk it. Okay, so that's part of it. And what goes on in your house? Have you got a calm house? Have you got a hectic house? You know, are there lots of people in living in the house? Is there only one person in the house? Are there other dogs in the house? Uh, so that has a, has a big effect, especially if the dog is at the top of the pecking order. The bigger the pack to take care of, the more pressure on the dog. The bigger the territory that the dog has to protect, the more pressure on the dog. Um, if people don't get along inside the house, that adds more pressure. And by the way, I'm not trying to, uh, insult anybody there, okay? I mean, we all have our squabbles sometimes, all right? And then last but not least is conversations with pack mates. And this is the area that counts. You cannot change their instincts. You can't change their personality. You, you probably can only tweak their environment unless you move. And, and basically, we, well, we won't go there. We won't get into much more detail about environment, okay? But no matter where, you know, uh, environment counts no matter where it is. Uh, and the last thing is our interactions with our dogs. That is where it's at. It's the only thing you can change. All right, because you can't change the other factors. Now, if it's about interactions with our dogs, then what is it that we are doing that, that causes behavioral challenges? And by the way, if you're catching on, you're the cause of the behavioral challenges. I'm not picking them. Change your dog's behaviors, make dog friendly changes in your interactions with them. And that's what I teach. So first of all, we apply human thinking to dogs. We are pack, have some similarities 
but dogs do not think like us, okay? As an example, when you come back from the grocery store or work or wherever you went, I would assume with a lot of you, if you're, particularly if your dog is loose, it's there at the door greeting you, right? Well, if you give it attention immediately, you're telling your dog that it's in charge. And that's why it's seeking your attention when you come in. So you don't have to do this for long, but you need to disregard your dog when you first return from a separation. No eye contact, talking or petting. And we'll cover this again, but basically you want it to go lie down someplace and relax. And after it's relaxed for several minutes, you can call it to you. Now you have reunited or rejoined with your dog like a leader. That's what I mean by human thinking. Now, when we come home, we would not ignore our other human pack mates, or at least I hope we wouldn't. Or when they come home, we wouldn't ignore them. But we need to disregard our dog when we, when we rejoin it after a separation. Okay, so that's a good example. One of the biggies is that we inadvertently reward unwanted behavior. If you acknowledge a dog's behavior, you are rewarding it. So if you make eye contact with it, talk to it, or pet it, when it's doing something that you don't want it to do, you are actually acknowledging, reinforcing that behavior. So if you got a dog that, for example, pesters you for attention, and it, maybe it does that by a kind of, it keeps pawing at your leg. Well, if you tell it no or stop it, um, make eye contact with it, or give in and pet it, you're rewarding that behavior. If your dog pulls on the leash, and you walk with it while it's pulling, you are rewarding that behavior. So just a couple of examples. We inadequately re reinforce desirable behaviors. And when I used to personally go into people's homes, and by the way, I still do in-home and into people's homes, because I also have a health issue, which I won't go into, but it affects my balance. So that's why I don't go into people's homes anymore, okay? But I used to see that all the time. People would call their dog to them and not act like they're happy to see them, like being too blase when they called the dog to them, all right? And last but not least, and I've already mentioned this, we inadvertently give our dogs a big high pressure job, which is leader in a world that it doesn't understand. And to give you an example of what that pressure might be like, and I'm gonna be honest, I'm exaggerating it a little bit, let's put you in charge of the police department in Granby or whatever town you live in. How would that be? Especially if you have no idea, you've never been a police officer, you have no train, you have no training for the job, maybe you have the wrong personality and you gotta make life and death decisions sometimes. That would be a pretty high stress job, right? So that's why I'm saying it's a big high pressure uh, job. And by the way, once we get that, that job away from our dogs, guess what their only jobs are? eat, sleep, and play. That's a carefree life, right? That's what we wanna give our dogs. So the solution is for you guys to make dog-friendly changes in, in, in your interactions with your dogs uh, in key areas. And it says it right, by the way, if you got the agenda in front of you, it talks about five areas, status, feeding, perceived danger, the hunt, to us, the walk, and play. And by the way, if my dog starts barking about something while we're, while we're doing this, I'm going to use the first step in the danger routine to see if I can get her to calm down. Sally, thank you. Come on, come here, good girl. Nice job, good girl. Now, some of you might think I'm just totally crazy. I've, you know, I've lost the plot or something because I was nice to my dog when she started barking because I want, I'm gonna stay calm because I want her to know that whatever she's fussing about, it's not a problem. If I yelled at her, then, you know, stop it enough, quiet. Then she would think I'm barking too. So this must be a problem because I want her to alert me to dangers. And I, in order for her to do that, I got to, I got to show her appreciation for alerting me to dangers. Okay. Um, but those are the five areas. And by the way, if you pick up a Jan Fennel book, you'd only see four areas because I have separated out play because I just think it makes it uh, the whole thing easier to deal with but I am true blue dog listener. I have not varied from the, the methodology for all the 12 years I've been doing this. 
Okay, so again, you know, kind of just to sum things up here for a minute, you're gonna to learn to think like your dog and speak its language. Again, just imagine the connection you will have with it if you understand why it behaves the way it does, what it's asking you, and you respond in canine language. And by the way, canine language is universal. Every canine around the world speaks the same language. As long as they came from the gray wolf, they speak the same language, okay? Um, and just a couple other points here is that through Zoom, the training is done on you and your dog's turf. That's a great place to do it because your dog is in its natural environment. And believe it or not, if you do this, you will get your dog much of the time to behave well voluntarily. I don't have to tell Sally, my pooch, much in terms of things to do. Because she doesn't spot, she doesn't bother me at the dinner table. She's not barking excessively. Um, she doesn't bother me when I want to sleep. Uh, a lot of times she just goes and lays down on her own without me ever saying anything to her. Or even sometimes sits on her own without me saying anything to her. Like if I want to put her leash on or something like that. Okay. And and she doesn't, you know, she doesn't bark excessively. She doesn't have separation anxiety. A lot of the things you might think of, uh, they're gone because she has leadership. And by the way, she's got a nervous, anxious personality. She would have a lot of behavioral problems if I was not her leader, or she, I mean, she was the leader instead. Okay, so let's move on to the article. Dogs don't bite out of the blue. I'm going to cover this real quick. I hope all of you got the article. I put it in for two reasons. Because, it, because most dog bites could be avoided by, when, particularly when you're meeting a strange dog or somebody is meeting and you assume your dog is friendly. You don't wanna make eye contact and go into a dog space because that can be taken as a threat. And some dogs have personal space issues. If you invade their space, they might just tell you off. And how is a dog gonna tell you off besides barking? Might give you a quick bite to put you in your place, like back off. And I realize bites aren't a good thing, but that's all, the, that's, that's the only, you know, the only line of defense a dog has is its teeth. So again, notice the, you know, the headline up at the top, a high percentage of dog bites can be prevented by avoiding contact and not invading the dog's space. And if you look at the box with all the images where it says dogs don't bite up, if people learn to read a dog's body language. So these eight pictures, actually seven of them, seven of them depict what, you know, situations where if you've got the possibility of meeting a strange dog, you probably shouldn't attempt it because the dog is trying to tell pressure. There's only one dog uh, here that's that out. That dog looks happy. You know, the next one down, tail straight up in the air, kind of a forward stance, uh, jaw clenched. That, that's a dog that's on pretty significant alert. That's a dog that might bite you if you tried, if you invaded its space. Next one down, lip lick, if you see a dog doing that, or also even batting its eyes a lot. Um, then, uh, uh, Annie, the pictures are in the article that I sent in the handouts. Um, okay, so um, uh, that's another thing you wanna watch for, or rapidly blink in their eyes. I'm not gonna go through all of these. Um, the next column, the one at the top, I used to always think yawning was fatigue. It's really a dog, that's a dog showing sign of stress or pressure. So if you do something to your dog and it starts yawning, it's probably something you don't wanna keep doing, okay? Or if you're trying to meet a dog and it's yawning, you know, take a rain check, all right? Uh, tail tuck, a lot of people know that's a scared dog. The next one down where the dog is turning away is a wonderful piece of canine language. It's basically saying, I do not want to communicate with you. All right? And we want to respect that. The other thing is you can use this. If your dog has a pestering behavior, a lot of times you can eliminate a pestering behavior just by ignoring your dog. And so if you turn your head this way to the side, I hope you can see me doing this. 
is that's a way of ignoring. No eye contact, no talking, no petting. You just turn your head to the side or you turn your whole body sideways. Do not turn your back to the dog though, because turning your back will make you more vulnerable. Okay? And by the way, I'm not getting into details on this stuff, but uh, let me tell you, I saw a video where a grizzly bear turned its back on two wolves and it proved that the grizzly bear was a lot more vulnerable because they attacked that grizzly bear from behind and then got away from it before it can turn around and bite them, all right? So that's a, that's a, that's a, a, a very good correction uh, to when you ignore the dog and it doesn't do them any harm. And the last but not least, the one at the bottom is, is really scared. I don't know if you can see it in the small picture. Uh, there are some other things that, you know, of course, if a dog is barking sharply, that says, hey, I, I don't want to meet you. If its hackles are going up on the back of it, you know, on its back, that's another sign. Uh, some dogs, when they're nervous, will pick up a paw and hold it nervously, nervously up in the air. Okay. So, uh, I think the article, not because I wrote it, covers pretty well what you want to do. Um, if you, if somebody wants to meet your dog, give them your dog's name, have them call the dog to them. That's the safest way to meet a dog. If your dog does not want to meet them, take a rain check, have the person take a rain check. Likewise, if you want to meet a dog and it doesn't want to come to you, take a rain check. We don't want you getting bit. And by the way, a very low percentage of dogs bite, but you don't want to encounter the one that 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 um, that might bite you because it's uncomfortable or it thinks you're challenging it or threatening it. Okay. Any questions so far? Anybody have any questions so far? Okay, so I'm going to move on. Dog friendly principles. You all got the dog friendly principles. It's the next handout or it's someplace in your package there, if it's not the next one, okay? I'm not gonna go through all of these, but just I just wanna highlight a few. Uh, number one up there, it says, it's what you do that counts, not what your dog does. That's what it's all about. Again, it's the, your interactions are what create the behaviors that you don't want. And the good news is that because that's the case, you have the power to change those behaviors by changing your interactions. Please do not blame your dog for its behavior. It's your interactions. If you can wrap your minds around that, regardless of what methodology you use, as long as it's a kind methodology, you're much more apt to be successful in the training. You certainly are with dog listening, okay? You're going to make all the leadership decisions. We will get into decisions, but one of the key decision is around when does your dog get love and affection? And we're gonna get into that, okay? And that happens, a, one of, a dog's favorite way of trying to find out where it fits in the pack and who's in charge is to seek your attention. So we're gonna come back to that. Dog listening is entirely non-confrontational. We don't intimidate the dog. There are no harmful gadgets. It is essential to be calm with your dog. It, 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 it does no good to get upset with a dog because you're just eroding the trust you need to build to become the leader. And the other thing is dogs do not follow unstable leaders. Us humans do, but dogs don't. So if you act nutty, your dog is gonna think, you're unstable, I'm not following you. You're not qualified to be a leader, okay? See, you wanna consistency send, consistently send your dog the leadership signals, consistency is convincing. Keep in mind that your dog needs to be able to connect the dots between its behavior and its con the consequence of behavior you're giving it, whether it's positive or negative. Anything over 10 seconds, Forget about it. Your dog does not know why you're rewarding it. You know, so people who reward their dog because it was a good boy or girl for going out in the backyard doing its business instead of in the home, if they give it a cookie when the dog comes in the home, it has it has no clue about why you, why you're rewarding it. You certainly has no clue. It cannot connect that you're happy it went in your backyard. All right, that's an example. Patience and persistence, you know what those mean. 
I could say, think ahead instead of plan ahead. When you get up in the morning, you're probably thinking about what you got to do and when you got to do it. And then that's just like the same thing you're going to do with your dog, but you're going to think about uh, things pertaining to establishing leadership, like maybe appropriately reuniting with your dog after you wake up. Okay, and we're going to come to reuniting so you'll know better know what that means. Uh, learn from your mistakes and move on. I think that's a great thing to think about in life, period. Never mind just with our dog. We don't need to beat ourselves up for making mistakes. Uh, make training fun for your dog. Don't overtrain. You do not have to train your dog for half an hour straight to be effective. You know, there are e exercises that you can do, like calling your dog to you or for a few minutes at a time uh, that, that you know, will work. It'll help the cause. You don't have to train for half an hour straight to be effective. Have a party when your dog does as, it, as requested. You always want to praise it. Hopefully, you can praise it and love it. And a lot of times you can give it a treat, but not every time because we don't want to turn it into a bride, all right? And last but not least, have fun, all right? Okay, all right, so now we are, this is the, um, Last handout, the Leadership Signals Memory Jogger. This is just an outline of the inf information that I'm gonna go over with you. We're not gonna get through all of it, but I'll, I'll try to get through as much of it as possible. I'm just trying to grab something here. It doesn't seem to wanna come out of my notebook. Okay, now it's here. So we're gonna start with the area of status and then move on to feeding, perceived danger, the hunt. You're probably wondering, well, what the heck is this guy talking about? I don't go hunting with the dog. Well, the instinct of a dog is that as soon as it hits the air, it's hunting. Regardless of whether you think it's a walk or not, the dog is on the hunt. And you wanna be the leader, not the dog. And by the way, if the dog is the leader, that's why it pulls, because decisions are made from the front of the pack, all right? And then, and then play. All right, starting with movement. Basically, you always want to call your dog to you to interact with it. If you go to it to interact with it, have a positive interaction, whether, whether it's giving it uh, affection or a food reward or putting its leash on or whatever, you are paying homage to your dog. You are subordinating yourself to it. When your dog comes to you, it is subordinating itself to you. Therefore, you are sending it a leadership signal. Basically, the only times you would go to your dog is to redirect it, take it by the collar and walk it away from something, or separate it from the pack. Here it says put in the timeout, which is just closing it in another room for a very brief timeout, or preventing it from being harmed. You know, preventing your dog from being harmed always takes priority. All right. Again, simple rule, general rule, call your dog to you if you wanna interact with it. Eye contact and talking. Eye contact works differently in the canine world than it does in our world. It means action. So if you make eye contact with your dog, it wants to know what you want. And if you don't tell it, you're putting pressure on your dog and confusing it. And the same goes for talking. So. Don't make eye contact or talk to your dog unless you want something from it. But by all means, make eye contact and talk when you want something from it. So it'll know what you want, like coming to you. So, you know, you would make eye contact with your dog, say its name pleasantly and say the come command. And when it gets to you, you can have a little conversation with it too. All right. So, so again, that's, you know, that, that's pretty straightforward. Only make eye contact to talk when you want something, then tell your dog what you want. We don't even correct verbally in dog listening because it sends a mixed message. No says, I don't want you to do it. But the fact that you're talking says, yes, I want you to do it. So even if you get the behavior that you want, you're still putting pressure on your dog and confusing. It. All right. Um, separation. Leaders come and go as they please, which means that when a leader leaves the pack, it just goes. 
whether it's a, a wild canine pack, a wolf pack, whatever. If, if it didn't, it would be basically elevating the status of the pack member that it looked at or interacted with before it left, all right? So immediately prior to leaving your dog, when you go to the grocery store or even go to the bathroom and close the door, don't interact with it. No eye contact, talking or petting, all right? And by the way, separate. what constitutes separation is you're closing the door, you're on one side of the door, the dog is on the other, or when you go to sleep. Now, all canines go through the reuniting ritual when they rejoin the pack. And, and, and so what that means is that when you come back from that separation, you want to disregard your dog at first, no matter how hard it's trying to get your attention. You're not being mean. You're By disregarding your dog, you're starting to tell it nothing happened to you while you were gone or asleep, and you're okay to be the leader. So it's essential to do this if you want to establish and maintain the leadership position. And what is reuniting? There's two versions. One is, and again, no eye contact or talking or petting. You want your dog to go lie down and relax for approximately five minutes. And once it's done that, then you can call it to you and give it all the love you want. There's no limit on love. All right? Because um, now you have real. That's the long version of reuniting. Hey, As Phil, you... I'm, yes. sorry to, I'm sorry to interrupt. It's Holly. But your internet has been a little spotty. So whatever key point you were just making in that last sentence, we lost it. So I if wonder, you want to make I might have had I might have had something on my keyboard. How's this? Well, I just want you to make that key point again because it, you sounded pretty passionate about it. And I went, what? <laughs> so oh, okay. if you can okay. if you can reframe that or regroup, that would be wonderful. Well, so you missed the reuniting, that, that, that there's two versions of reuniting, a long version which is letting the dog relax for at least five minutes. But once you start doing this, your dog is gonna spend less and less time trying to get your attention when you return from a separation. So you know you're making progress. When your dog practically spends no time trying to get your attention, like a matter of 15 or 20 seconds, uh, when you reunite and it walks away, you can call it right back and give it all the love you want. The key is, that you're not giving your dog the attention immediately when it's seeking it. Did that come through okay? We we got it that time, thank you. Okay, so yeah, I think that was my fault. I probably put something on the keyboard. Um, I'm still not trained yet, you know? Uh, any, anyway, okay, so, uh, and by the way, when you call your dog to you, again, have a little party. So you, so you finish the reuniting routine uh, by calling your dog to you. Now, um, I skipped over affection and attention purposely because we're talking about something that's very similar to reuniting, although the circumstances are a little bit different. So when is it okay? I, remember, I, I mentioned that dogs figure out where they fit in the pack by seeking attention from us. So when is it okay to pay attention? Well, if the dog has got to go out, we better not mess with that one. You want to take the dog out. If it alerts you to something on the outside that it wants you to check out, like a da possible danger, we want to pay attention to that, okay? Uh, we know that we, that, um, um, and there's a third one there, which is if you're walking with it nicely by your side and it looks up at you, it's asking you, where are we going? And then you can make eye contact with it or say good, but you, you really answer the question by continuing to walk in the same direction or ch is the question, okay? If for now, I would just focus on the first two. Your dog has got to go out as an exception that's okay to make or your dog alerts you to danger. All right. So how can we do this properly to give our dogs love and attention? Again, the dog seeks attention because it's asking you the question, 
Who's in charge now, you or me? All right? So if it comes over and sta sits, stands in front of you and stares at you, sits and stares at you, paws you on the knee, uh, sticks its uh, face on your, sticks its chin on your, on your knee, anything, brings you a dish towel, brings you a toy, it is asking you the question, who's in charge now? And you are going to answer it, I am in charge by totally disregarding your dog. You're going to let it walk for, so you're going to do this, you know, to turn the head away or turn your body sideways to it. Um, and you're going, so you're going to let it walk away. Once it's walked away at least four steps, so this is not a long delay, you can call your dog right back to you and give you, give it all the love you want because now you're giving it attention on your terms, not the dog's terms. So by disregarding it, you sent it a leadership signal, and by getting it to come back to you, you sent it another leadership signal. So keep in mind, again, this is the, favorite, the dog's favorite way of finding out where it fits in the pack and who is in charge. So it's a key area for you to follow. Actually, it's key to follow all these guidelines, but uh, this is its favorite way of figuring out where it fits in the pack. Next up, do maintain your personal space. Your dog should not get into your space unless invited. So that means touching you. It doesn't get in your lap by uh, on its own. It doesn't uh, climb up on the couch with you and lean against you or lie against you, even though it feels very good on its own. Um, it doesn't doesn't lie on your feet. It doesn't lean against your legs. None of that stuff, you have to invite it into your space. If your dog is invading your space, it is showing you disrespect. I bet you didn't know you were being disrespected because it feels good. But that's another thing that tells the dog that, you, that it is in charge. I can tell you my dog, I, I cannot remember the last time she invaded my space without being invited. Okay, and I love her like crazy. I, you know, I, I give her lots of love. Um, so that's another key thing. And the last one, the question is who is on the throne? Has nothing to do with the bathroom. Uh, your, your bed is your throne. It also has to do with other furniture. Uh, your dog should not be up in the bed with you unless invited. Okay, because that's your throne. So you want to have it up in the bed to cuddle with you. That's fine, but you've got to invite it up there. And again, not when the dog is being tricky to try to get your attention, like sitting by the side of the bed and you know looking at you, um, uh, staring at you, uh, lying on the floor and rolling over on its back to try to get you to rub its tummy. And by the way, if you on its back, who's practicing recall with whom? Okay, your dog is calling you to it, all right? So we don't wanna do that. Um, okay, so that's the maintain your personal space, very simple. Dog does not touch you without being invited. I'm sorry, and then uh, one second. And yeah, who's on, the, who's on the throne or other furniture? I, I kind of strayed there for a minute. Um, other furniture is okay. You know, if you have a nice long couch, uh, and the dog gets up on one side and you're up on the other, that's not a problem. You don't have to invite it. The only time being on furniture is a problem uninvited is if the dog protects that furniture, guards it, gets upset when you come, when you approach it on the furniture. Even just to sit down, you're not trying to interact with the dog. Okay, who's somebody's got a question? Yes. What's the correction if they are up on the furniture uninvited? Well, you would just, actually, that's a good question. Basically, you, you just push it out of your space. Not so hard that you hurt it. Just don't make eye contact or talk with it. So you would push, if it's in your space, you push it out of your space. If, if you didn't want, if, you know, if it's, um, you know, as long as it's with, I mean, if it's touching you, it's within reach. So you can always push it off the couch or, or off the chair that it maybe climbed up on. And then when it comes back, no eye contact or talking, you can just block it. You can block it with your hand. You can block it with a leg. You know, we just don't want to do anything that's going to hurt the dog. And by the way, there's circumstances where a dog would block you 
like if it wanted to get out the back door first, some, some dogs actually block their human pack mates because the one who gets out first is the leader. Okay, we'll come back to that. We don't want it being the leader, all right? So uh, that's the stuff under status. It's a big area. It's got a lot of things under there. And by the way, you've got my contact information in the handouts. Hey, to call me anytime between 9 a.m. and 9 p.m. on any day of the week. If you got a question, you know, you can always text me or you can always send me an email. I do not write long emails in response because they're too easy to misinterpret. And I may not put the right, I, I may put something in an email that's confusing. So we really need a live dialogue a lot of times to handle behavioral questions, okay? Um, all right, so let's move on to feeding. Wolves are predators, scavengers. You probably figured out predator and scavenger, what the heck is an opportunistic eater? Just because they normally hunt big game doesn't mean they might not grab a rabbit that gets too close. That's an opportunistic eater. In our world, an opportunistic eater surfs your counters. So our dogs are predators, right? They're hunters. Uh, they will. Some dogs will grab stuff off the coffee table or the counter, and some dogs will go into the garbage. So they're opportunistic eaters and scavengers also. Okay, so we have to understand that with canines, food is food. It doesn't matter where it is or what form of it it's in, if it's edible, whether it came out of a kibble bag, uh, a can, um, or you took it out of the refrigerator, it doesn't matter. It's food, all right? And I'm, I'm saying this because it's, it's very important. Leaders govern food. They, they, they control food time, who eats when. So, and by the way, what we're talking about here is mimicking the signals your dog is looking for to figure out where it fits in the pack. And certainly food is a key area. Food is about um, survival. So in the wild, especially if food is scarce, the leader, number one, eats first. It eats undisturbed. It eats the best parts of the kill. It eats all it wants to eat. No wolf would ever leave a kill before it's done eating because there may be no opportunity to go back to it. You know, a picky eater in the wild would not survive. Some of our dogs are picky eaters to show us that they control food. That's why they're picky eaters, okay? So again, that you know, in the wild, the leader eats first, it eats undisturbed, you better not bug the leader when it's eating. It eats, uh, it eats the best parts of the kill, it eats all it wants to eat, and when it leaves the kill, that's the signal to the next in line. Same thing, that one eats undisturbed, eats the best parts of the kill, eats all it wants to eat, uh, and then when it leaves the kill, that's the signal to the next. And by the way, in the wild, a wolf can eat 15 to 20 pounds of meat in a feeding. And why would they do that? Let's think about it. We're the only creatures on earth that know when we're going to eat again. If we didn't, like uh, our like creatures, other creatures in the animal world, you know, we went over somebody's house and they had a nice roast beef on their counter, we might steal it too. Because we wouldn't know when we're going to eat it again. So you see what the see what's what the thinking is that's going on with the um, with with the dog, why sometimes they do some of the things that they uh, do. Now, how are we going to replicate, you know, the kind of the eating process in the wild? We're going to do something called gesture eating. Before we put the dog's food bowl down, we're going to eat a couple of tidbits of human food. Whether it's a couple of pieces of cheese, a couple of uh, a couple of grapes, you know, maybe two little pieces of cracker, we're going to eat that before we put the bowl down and step away, and that's called gesture eating. So, what does the dog see if we do this? I'll go into a little bit more detail. Okay, 
the dog sees that. And by the way, once you get the dog in the kitchen, whether it's because you called it in or it heard you starting to prepare its food, no more interaction with your dog. No eye contact, talking or petting. You go about with meal preparation. You get the empty bowl out. You put a couple of tidbits of human food next to it. You make the dog's meal. You pick up the bowl if you're going to go walk someplace with it, along with your tidbits, or if you're going to put it down on right from the counter. Okay. In any event, where, whether you're at the counter or you walk over to put the bowl down someplace else, you're going to eat tidbit number one, you know, chew it up, swallow it, put tidbit number two in your mouth, start chewing on it, put the bowl down and step away. And what you want to have happen, of course, is that the dog goes to the bowl quickly and eats all its food. Notice that you haven't had any interaction with the dog. Okay. And by the way, if your dog jumps on you, starts yipping, jumping up and down, you are going to stop meal preparation and just stand there until your dog calms down. We don't ask the dog to sit and stay. And by the way, calm dog, four on the floor, four paws on the floor with, with a wagging tail is calm enough. But we want the dog to have self-control. So we stop all movement until the dog calms down. And then we proceed again with meal preparation. And we keep stopping if the dog gets overly excited. You know, it might take you 20 minutes to a half an hour to feed the dog doing this, but I guarantee you, it won't be too many repetitions of this little routine before the dog will stand there nice and calmly while you're making uh, its, its meal. Okay, you wanna gesture eat for two weeks. Uh, and then one to then you can cut back to one to do two. Um, always pick up the bowl when your dog vacates it. To your dog, the bowl is the bones of the kill. We don't leave food where a dog can access it whenever it wants because that tells it it's in charge of food. And by the way, you cannot fake your dog out. You cannot pretend to eat something because the dog knows you have not eaten. Because it sees you haven't eaten, it hears that you haven't eaten, and its sense of smell is so strong, it knows that your saliva did not change chemistry. It can actually smell the change in your saliva. And by the way, for any of you who, whose dogs are um, with you, right near you right now, uh, its sense of smell is so, so good that I could if you get upset, it would smell the change in your body chemistry, um, and it would also hear your heart beating faster. Okay, amazing senses of smell and and um, uh, and, and hearing. Okay, I, I'm covered a lot of ground here so far. Any questions about these first two areas? And I got one more. I actually I got two more points to give. So no question. Kyle. No, we, we oh. have a question there. Oh, so I'm sorry. Uh, okay. I do have one. I have I have one question, Phil. Go ahead. If when when your dog is alerting to you to something that's not really a danger, like you know, I have one dog that like there's it's like there's nothing out there, but they're barking outside and something. Do you still react the same way with the calm, like yes, okay, a thanks, and absolutely because your dog can hear and smell things that you don't even know exist. Mm-hmm. Even, even though it's still inside your home. Okay. I mean, I mean, their sense of smell is, is so strong that if you were making beef stew tonight, you'd smell beef stew, right? <laughs> your dog, would, your dog could, could pick out each individual ingredient in the beef stew. Uh-huh. All right. It can okay, because she, dog, it seems like I, she's doing nothing, like barking at nothing. I'm like, I just, and I literally, I'm like, that's a leaf in the yard. That's, or there's a car in a different spot. She's trying to <laughs> tell yeah, me she's... about him. Like, okay, thank you, but she's she does she still barks. Well, then, well, we'll go, we're going to go through the three steps of of handling danger. Okay, 
Perfect. Thank you. All right. Okay. Thank you for the question. I, I, I appreciate it. Okay. Now, all of us have probably been told to feed our dog on a schedule, right? You better feed it around the same time in the morning and the same time in the evening. Guess what? In the wild, canines don't have a routine like that. Uh, in fact, if food is plentiful, they still may eat only once every three days on average because lots of hunts are unsuccessful in the wild. every six or seven days. Sometimes they go as long as two weeks without eating. And if they go too long, obviously it costs them their lives. So instead of, see, if you have a routine and you follow that routine religiously, religiously day in and day out, where you feed the dog at the same spot or place in your routine, it's gonna be able to predict when food is coming. In fact, some of your dogs may start bugging you and say, hey, wait a minute, it's like they got a raw, you know, a, 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 a watch on their paw or something. Hey, it's food time. That's because you're using the same routine. And if you give a dog food when it's seeking it, you're telling it it's in charge of food. All right. Um, the other thing is if you've got a nice meat bone that you leave, you don't want to leave it. Pick it up when the dog leaves, leaves it, just like you're going to pick up the dog bowl, because again, you don't want your dog to have access to food uh, whenever you want it. And last but not least, if you walk with the bowl to put it down someplace in a room, you don't just feed the dog off the counter, you don't eat your human tidbits until where you're going to put the bowl down. In other words, you cannot walk with the kill if you've eaten. And keep in mind, that's how your dog views its food bowl. It's the kill. That's the only way it can relate to it. It doesn't understand the concept of a bowl because they don't understand the human world. All right. So let's go on to uh, um, danger, unless anybody's got questions ahead of danger. I'm, I'm going to keep danger fairly straightforward. Okay. Basically, in the wild, it's the job of, of subordinate pack members to alert to danger. The leaders make the decisions. So subordinates alert, leaders decide. If your dog is a leader in our world, then it thinks it's got to make the decisions about dangers because it doesn't trust your decision making. You have not demonstrated you're, you're qualified to be a leader. In fact, to your dog, you're probably like juvenile delinquents. Okay. And I, of course, I'm saying that, you know, facetiously, but the dog sees you like a child, or like a parent would see a three year old child. It thinks it's the mom or dad in the house instead of you being the mom or dad in the house, as, that, as hard as that might be to believe. Okay. All right. Danger takes precedence. You don't have to reunite to deal with a danger. Um, and you know, the dog is in a world that doesn't understand, so anything can be a threat to it, all right? Your behavior is going to determine your dog's behavior. So if you stay calm, that lets the dog know that that particular issue is not a danger, it's not a problem. If you get all upset, the dog thinks you're barking too, so this must be a biggie. You're barking because you're joining your dog. You're going to help get rid of that problem. Maybe even, uh, you know, end its life. Okay. Um, and by the way, dog, a lot of times fear, a lot of times aggression is fear aggression. It's because the dog is so scared it's overreacting to something that it perceives as a danger. It's not necessarily an aggressive dog. It's just overreacting. And you probably heard the term reactive dog. So if it's a leader, again, it doesn't understand our world, it might overreact to something, all right? So three-step process. And by the way, in the wild, a, a subordinate member would either bark or howl to get the leader's attention, and the leader would go check out the danger. And if it's not a danger, the leader just calmly walks away. And if it is a danger, the leader has three choices, flight, F-L-I-G-H-T, freeze, or fight, F-I-G-H-T. So, you know, the reputation of the wolf, what do you think its favorite choice is? Flight, freeze, or fight? 
Now, if anybody was thinking fight, that's not correct. It's flight. If the leader doesn't think that the pack can contend with the danger, it leads the whole pack away because nobody gets hurt. So just like the wolf, our dog's favorite choice in face of danger is flight. If your dog is afraid of thunder or fireworks, that's the reason why some of your dogs might run to the nearest closet or the bathroom or even get into the bathtub because it's trying to get away from the danger. That's why it's doing what it's doing, okay? Or if it wants to pull you away from something on the outside, it wants to get away from the danger, not toward it, all right? So how are we going to replicate, you know, what, what the dog is looking for basically from us and to demonstrate that we're the ones that handle dangers, not your dog? Well, you saw step one already when my dog was fussing, probably didn't even hear her fussing, but I did. And you're, no matter where you are in your house, even if you're behind a closed door because danger takes precedence, you're going to thank your dog for alerting you to the danger. So if, you know, you're, if, you're, if your dog is um, you know, named, uh, I don't know what, Peppy, you're going to say, Peppy, thank you. And then if you can, you're gonna call Peppy to you. And of course, you're gonna give the dog some love when it gets to you. And if that does the job, you're done. You don't have to do anything else because your calmness indicated to your dog that this is not a problem. But maybe the dog is thinking, hey, wait a minute, you didn't come check this out. So if it stays at the window or door that it's barking at or through or whatever, you, you gotta do step number two which is you're gonna go take a look, take a good look, doesn't matter whether or not you've seen anything, and you're gonna to turn to your dog and thank it again. So you're gonna say, Peppy, thank you. And come, you know, come with me, start moving away from the window or door. And, um, you know, if the dog follows you and doesn't go back and bark anymore, then you're done. And, and by the way, about 50% of the time at first. And then as the dog trusts your decision-making more, it will, it, it, the percentage of time that it works will, will uh, increase significantly. Steps one and two will work probably 95% of the time once you've been practicing them for a while. Because again, by your... So it won't bark as much, at much, stuff, any, as much stuff anymore. Now, what happens if the dog just doesn't want to stop barking or runs back and barks some more? You're going to separate it from the pack, which is one of our favorite corrections because it doesn't do the dog any harm, but they don't like to be separated from the pack. You're just going to put it in another room for a quick timeout of a count to 10. And if it's quiet, you'll let it out. And if it doesn't bark anymore, it gets to stay out, it gets to keep the pack. If it goes right back and starts barking, then you're gonna put it right back into timeout. It loses the pack. They don't like to lose the pack. So you might have to repeat the timeout several times, okay? But eventually the dog's gonna get the message. You wanna keep the pack, you gotta be calm and quiet. You're not calm and quiet, you lose the pack. It's as simple as that. And by the way, timeouts can be used for other persistent behavior, like they don't want to stop jumping on people or they're, they're mouthing. Mouthing is an unacceptable behavior. Or they you know, grab your clothing. That's an unacceptable behavior. Your shoes or whatever, bite you on the toes. All that's unacceptable. Now, let's say you can't get your dog into timeout. Well, if there's not, you know, if there's, if there's, you know, if, if, Unless you've got a lot of people there, or maybe too many people, Let, let's put this with multiple people, you can execute a timeout by you all closing yourselves into another room. The dog still loses you. So if you've got one dog, you can do that. That's another way of doing a timeout. Okay. So then that, especially when your dog is fussing in timeout. Uh, if we have time when we, you know, before we finish, I'll come back to this. Um, 
All right. Now, let's say you got a fenced in yard. You're on the inside and your dog is on the outside in your fenced in yard and starts barking. Remember, you don't have to reunite. So you stick your head out the door and you thank your dog and try to call it in. Basically, same routine, right? If it doesn't come in and you're able, you go out in the backyard and get near your dog and take a look and see if you can see what it's barking at and you thank it again and invite it to come in with you. Now, here's where it gets tricky, okay? Because you can't chase your dog around the yard if you have to go to step three and put it in a timeout. Because if you're chasing the dog, who's in charge? Who's in front? The dog. So all you can do is go back in, which in effect separates the dog from the pack. And if that still doesn't work, you just start over. But eventually it'll get so that it'll work. You just gotta keep practicing, okay? And it fusses about another dog or another person or wants to go after a rabbit, we're going to use flight to help change the dog's behavior. So you thank your dog and take flight. So you would say, thank you, Peppy, and then you would get it away from whatever it's concerned about as quickly as possible. You don't have to break into a sprint, but you keep taking it away until your dog is no longer concerned with the danger. And you know, I've, I've taught two dogs since I started this, Abby first, and now my, my, my current, my pooch, um, you know, not to react to squirrels and rabbits, you know, and other dogs and cats and things like that. It just takes time. It's repetition. You keep repeating this thank and flee. All right. So that's a way to that's a way to get it to trust your decision making because you're choosing flight. Um, All right, any questions? I, you know, I, I've, I've skipped over fireworks and thunder. If we got time, we can come back to it. Because you can, let me just say, if your dog gets upset about thunder or fireworks, just stay calm. And the other thing is don't start doing poor baby routine on it. You know, cuddling and petting it, because I know that's what our normal reaction is. But if you do that, you're telling the dog your the noise, the loud noise. So all you got to do is call a dog over to you and calmly hold it against you. Or this is one in, one exception where you can go to the dog and bring it by your side and sit and hold it against you. Okay. And what, and by not doing anything other than holding it against you, the message to the dog is that this is not a problem because you're calm and you're holding it against you. You don't talk to it, you don't make eye contact. When it relaxes, you can let it go. And it might take 10, 15 minutes for it to relax. If it starts getting scared again, you repeat this little procedure, which we call a calm hold or a calm freeze. That's the way to get it past loud noises. But it's critical for you to stay calm. If you get mad at the dog for barking, you're just gonna make it bark more. And it's going to get more afraid of fireworks or thunder if that's what the issue is. Okay, so that's a that's a that's a, a rundown of um, perceived danger. Three step process: thank and call to you. If that doesn't work, you go to step two, which is go take a look, thank and invite the dog to come with you. And if that still doesn't work, step three is timeout. You might have to repeat the timeouts. I once put a dog in a timeout 20 times. It wasn't, had, didn't have to do a danger is that it kept pestering me. It finally quit pestering me after 20 times, believe it or not. That's my record. Usually dogs will stop. If they're repeated, you know, we're talking about consecutively. All right. Now let's kind of just skip over the hunt for a minute and go to play because play is pretty straightforward and the hunt is more involved, okay? There is no such thing as a toy in the canine world. It's what we call them. There's no such thing as a ball or a Frisbee. This, these are our labels, okay? Um, what it really represents 
is that it is a trophy. It's a status symbol. So it means it's about status in the pack. The more toys a dog has control of, the more you are elevating your dog in the pack. And the one that has the control of the most trophies is usually the leader. All right, so if you've got a whole bunch of, of uh, Nyla bones, toys, stuffed animals, uh, balls, whatever, a whole basket full of stuff, you are you have really elevated the status of your dog in the pack. So you probably don't like to hear this, but you know what? You don't have to throw all these toys away. But what you want is if you got a single dog is probably to have no more than four objects that it can access. And I'm using objects, you know, cause it could be a mix of, you know, a couple of chew bones or a rope and a toy or whatever, but you don't want to have it have a whole bunch of trophies that it has control of. And by the way, when your dog brings your shoe to you to ask you who's in charge, your shoe is a trophy. So if it prances around in front of you with the trophy, it's not like it's bragging, but it's just, you know, it's kind of just showing you, hey, you know, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, you know, look at me. I'm higher in the pack. And by the way, they don't see, they don't do spite or anything like that. They don't have complex emotions like that. If it brings you a dish towel, that's also a trophy. Okay, so we've got a question here to everyone. What if you have kids that leave their stuffed animals where the dog can get them? Well, I know sometimes this is mission impossible, but you want to dog proof your home so it can't grab stuff. You know, it can have access to what you know, it, it's few toys and, and, a, you know, and, a, and a couple of chews that it can have access to. And again, you can rotate this stuff. So yeah, I think, I, you know, you wanna involve your kids in the dog training, so he's around. And, you know, stuff toys with some dogs, I'm not saying necessarily yours, but they can be really dangerous because if the dog tears it apart and swallows something it shouldn't be swallowing, and by the way, dogs think that toys are, you know, they're practicing basically their, their skills from the wild. Think about tug of war. What's, what, what would canines particularly be more apt to have a tug of war over in the wild? Wolves, a piece of meat. So that's why, you know, dogs wanna play tug of war with us. We do not recommend playing tug of war with your dog. Because if your dog thinks it's stronger than you, then now, you, now you, 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 you've made it the leader or potentially made it the leader. They can play tug of war with each other, okay? And by the way, when your dog rips apart a stuffed toy, it thinks it's prey. And see, play is about status in the pack and it, it, it's about practicing for the hunt. Okay. All right. So, okay. So how do you play like a leader? It's straightforward. You choose the toy, let's say a ball, and you use it to start the game. And what's a typical game people might play with? Gets us to the next thing. You make up the rules of the game. So if you really want to play fetch with your dog and you're going to hold it to the rules of fetch, and by the way, it's fine to use a command, commands, because you got to tell your dog what it wants. Um, you would throw the ball and say fetch, right? The dog gets it, good. You now have successfully done the first step. The next step is to get it to come back to you so you can tell it to come, right? And if it comes back, hey, we're good now, almost. And then the last thing you want it to do is to drop it or put it in your hand. And if you can get it to do that by saying, you know, drop it or you had one iteration of successful fetch. So if the dog keeps playing by those rules, then game on. As soon as it, it breaks the rules, game is over. You need to end the game. And by the way, you want to end play time anyway, if you can, because leaders also end play time.
if your dog doesn't like to play fetch, not a problem. If you can get it to chase balls, as long as it keeps chasing balls, game on. As soon as it refuses to chase a ball, game over. Okay, so, you, so, so again, play is you choose the toy, you use it to start the game, you make up the rules of the game and you end the game. Now, by the way, any questions? You know, one of the things I miss about not doing these lives, is live these things live, is I used to get lots of questions live. I guess people are kind of, what, video shy? Anyway, that's okay. Okay, the hunt. The leader always leads the hunt. The leaders are the decision makers. They have to be at the front of the pack. This is why your dog tries to get out the door first when you leave with it. Okay, if it's doing that. And it's also why it tries to get back into your house first. On the way out, your dog wants to be the leader, which gives it the job of conducting the hunt and uh, checking for dangers. Now, on the way back into your home, the dog thinks it's its job to check for dangers. These need to be your jobs. So we want you to be uh, the leaders. The other thing is, you know, there's there is this, and, I, and by the way, I want to preface this by saying I'm not suggesting that you don't give your dog. Well, I mean, and by the way, if you enjoy running with it, by all means, keep running with it or walking with it. Okay. But there's no prescription. For a, for a dog having a certain amount of exercise in order to avoid behavioral challenges. I want you to think about something. If exercise could, could, could cure behavioral problems, all world-class athletes would be angels. Your dog's behavioral problems are not due to lack of exercise. I'm not saying that exercise might not have a transient effect on your dog, but you're not going to fix behavioral problems with exercise. You fix behavioral problems with what we've talked about. Don't reward what you don't want, reward what you do want. You guys become the pack leaders. Okay, that's, 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 that's what you need to do. That's how you fix behavioral problems. Okay, so the first thing about lead the hunt is you wanna be able to get your dog to come to you. If you can't get it to come to you, you've already got a problem, right? Because then you gotta subordinate yourself to it to put its leash or harness on, whatever you're doing. So practice recall with your dog. Start in the house where there are no distractions uh, and lots, of, lots fewer distractions and dangers. You know, when, when you get it going well in the house, then you can shift and practice it more and more on the outside where there is a lot of distractions and, and, and dangers. And by the way, given the dog's sense of smell, every time it hits the air, besides thinking it's hunting, I mean, it's a world of a thousand distractions and dangers because of, of its keen sense of hearing and keen sense of smell, okay? Excuse me a minute, I gotta just flip the light on here. because I got my blinds closed. It's getting a little bit darker in here. All right, so you wanna practice recall. The next thing uh, in the, um, in here, let me just take, I just wanna make sure you have this. It says, Okay, okay, the next one up is you and your dog are calm from start to finish. Eliminate triggers. What the heck does this mean? Well, if you are tense, you're in a rush. Of course, I realize if you gotta get your dog out to go to the bathroom, you probably haven't got much choice. And or your dog is overly excited, that is a formula for a more difficult walk, 
where the dog might be more excitable, might, might react to more things, might pull more. So we want you to be calm and we want the dog to be calm. What is a trigger? A trigger is anything that gets your dog overly excited, like its leash or like its harness or like you putting on a particular pair of shoes. So we need to eliminate these things as triggers. The way, you, for example, to eliminate the leash as a trigger, if you don't mind doing it, and if the dog doesn't jump on you, wear the leash like a fashion accessory as you move around your house. See, because we need to turn, we need to have that leash have no meaning to the dog. It doesn't mean we're going out anymore. It doesn't mean we're going on the hunt anymore. Same thing with, a, with shoes that you reserve just for walking the dog. If the dog gets excited about them, wear the shoes around the house. Okay, then again, it, it doesn't have any meaning. And by the way, you can do this with your car keys also. Um, now, it, now, if you don't wanna wear the leash you know, uh, kind of thing, you can just put the leash down someplace where your dog can't reach it and move it every minute. Every minute you're gonna move the leash because eventually that turns the leash into nothing. Same thing with your car keys. If the dog gets crazy about you taking out car keys because it thinks it's going bye-bye car. And by the way, if you ask the dog, hey, you wanna go bye-bye car, bye-bye car? Well, what's your dog gonna do when you get the keys out? It's gonna get all excited. So we don't wanna get it wound up because that it makes the dog think it's in charge. It's getting ready to be in charge. That's why it's getting all wound up. We don't want it all wound up. We want it calm. And we want you calm so you can have the most pleasant walk possible. You should enjoy the walk and your dog should enjoy the walk. Okay. And if you're the leader, your dog will enjoy the walk because it will stay nicely by your side on a loose leash because it feels safe with you. And it wants to be by your side because it feels safe with you. And by the way, this is, the, this is the toughest area to gain trust is on the outside because there's lots of distractions. You know, there's things that your dog might want to go after. So you, it just takes practice and time to master things on the outside. But you can do it. And by the way, there's lots of behaviors that you can correct fairly quickly, like pestering or jumping on people. Um, you know, uh, in, in, a, in a matter of days, Sometimes while I'm talking to people on the phone, I tell them to ignore their dog. It's, they stop pestering. The, correct, the, the, the behavior starts improving right away. Okay? So it, you can have, there's areas where you can have immediate uh, improvement. Barking is not that hard to eliminate if you do it right. Okay? So those are some of the things, areas that you can improve. Separation anxiety is a little bit harder. We didn't talk about separation anxiety because we didn't have time. Okay, I, got, I'll, I better keep marching here, otherwise I'm gonna chew up, the rest of the, chew up the rest of the time. All right, so you want your dog calm. You wanna go out first and come back in first. And first is a little bit misleading. I want the dog nicely by your side, you know, not trying to get ahead of you on the way out or the way back in. Um, and you can do this uh, by by uh, basically one of the techniques when you have time to practice this, get your dog on a leash and try to head out the door without it running ahead of you. If it runs ahead of you, you're going to pull it back in and start over. And if it takes you 30 times to get the dog to not run ahead of you while you're doing this, it takes you 30 times. So you better practice this when you have time, but eventually you will get it. And there is a Nigel Reed video online that shows him doing this. And he says after 32 times, the dog finally followed him. It did not try to run ahead of him. And you can use the same technique for getting the dog to stay by your side when you go inside, when you're going in, okay? Again, you want to be first because decisions are made from the front of the pack. Now, the other thing to help us become pack leaders, we practice a follow the leader exercise that we call, and not that I'm in love with this, this, this uh, title, 
uh, stop, start, change direction. I like to call it follow the leader. If you stop and your dog stops, who made this decision to stop? You did, right? Because you were the one who stopped and then your dog stopped. If you change direction and your dog follows you, who's made the decision about where you're going? You did, right? So we can put together this little exercise of stop, start, change direction, which is essentially you do a couple of ways. And you can start by using a food reward, you know, put it down by your uh, leg where you call your dog to the food reward. And if it comes and he gets the food reward. Now what you would like to do is complete a little loop, if you will, where the dog follows you four steps forward, you stop and turn and retrace your steps, four steps back in the other direction. And you can keep repeating this, all right? And it may take you, but it will eventually start following you. To stop and where to go. What uh, now? Another way of doing this is just to go four steps forward, stop, and back, and backpedal four steps back. There's plenty of videos online demonstrating this stop, start, change direction. Uh, uh, Tony Knight has a couple. Nigel Reed has, um, you know, has some. A lady uh, named uh, Caroline Spencer has has a very good video. I have a video of me on my resources page. I'm, I'm video shy, by the way, but there is a video of me demonstrating stop, start, change direction with Sally. So in a five minutes of doing stop, start, change direction, you can blitz your dog with, with, with 50 leadership signals because you're making all the decisions to stop and all, and all the decisions about where to go. On the outside, your dog does get to decide when to stop if it's got to do its business. We don't want to keep trying to drag it while it's doing its business. Okay, so that's that's an essential exercise. It says in the you know the the uh, some of the documentation that I put out that you want to practice this thirty minutes a day. Thirty minutes. You don't have to do it thirty minutes a day. In fact, you can do it five minutes at a time. Do it when there's commercials on TV. Try to make this part of your life to help you do it, okay? Um, the time, um, we've talked about some of the corrections. Ignoring is just pushing, it's just turning your head away. We've talked about pushing away if the dog invades your space. Redirect, you catch your dog jumping on the counter, just grab it by the collar and walk it away. Again, we're going to stay calm. We're not going to make eye contact or talk when we're correcting the dog. The timeout we've talked about a little bit, and we talked about the last one, the movement. If your dog pulls while you're walking with it, you can either start doing stop, start, change direction. So you're making the decisions about when to stop and where to go, or you can stop and hold your ground, and you do that until the dog releases the tension in the leash. And by the way, all, we always want slack in the leash when we're walking our dog. So if you use this stop and hold your ground and then move immediately when your dog releases the tension, it learns we're going nowhere if I pull and we are gonna have movement uh, when there's slack in the leash. They want the movement. So then they stop pulling, they learn. So they can learn by observation. They're very smart. Okay, so uh, if we want to, is, is, uh, Holly, is it okay if we spend a few minutes on questions if anybody has any? Absolutely, Phil. This is, I, I'm always fascinated by, um, I've heard your presentation before and I'm always fascinated by it because it just, it just, I just think back to all of the dog issues over the years, but, um, Anyhow, um, while you were talking, though, um, I, I don't know if I can jump in on this one. I did get a question um, 
uh, from a listener about separation anxiety. And I, I think you might have jumped over that. Yes, uh, I did. Is there is there are there any pieces that you could share that maybe don't take a long yeah. time? Or? Yeah, the, the reason there's separation anxiety is your dog thinks it has to go with you to take care of you. It's as simple as that, because, again, it thinks it's the mom or the dad in the pack and you're the three year old child that's got to take care of. So just imagine your three year old child walking out the door and you didn't know where it went. You would be highly anxious yourself. And, you know, it can vary with dogs depending on the degree they believe they need to take care of you. So it could be as simple as, you know, extended barking or whining all the way to severe separation anxiety where the dog destroys property, either because it's chewing on it to try to calm itself down because its brain and releases endorphins when it chews, or even in more severe cases, the dog tries to dig its way or bite its way out of the house. And I've seen, you know, claw marks. I've seen holes in sheetrock where the dog has tried to dig its way out of the house. And I know of a couple of instances where the dog has jumped out the window to try to go after its owners. Because again, it thinks it's losing its child. Its child is gone. It doesn't know where it went. Which if, you know, a mom or a dad, their child walked out the door would be pretty frantic if they didn't know where the child went. And by the way, if your child has ever done this, what did you do when your child came back? You know, if that wasn't gone too long, or you would do anyway, you jump for joy, my baby's back. So when you're on the, when the dog, when the, when the dog saw you left, it's kind of comparable to, oh my God, I've lost my baby. And then when you come back, my baby's back. That's why some of you are greeted so excitedly when you come back from a separation. Yes, your dog loves you. Yes, it's happy to see you but it's, you know, it's, it's overjoyed because it couldn't go with you and take care of you. By the way, how many of you does your dog follow you around the house? I'll give you the answer rather than asking to, than making you think too much about it. It's following you around the house because it's making sure you're not getting in trouble. It's the same thing you would do with a toddler. Okay, so, oh my goodness. Um, oh, that, it all makes so much sense. It all makes so much sense. Um, I don't want to monopolize. I did get uh, um, some of those questions from some of our other listeners. Um, okay. So do, do we have other folks? Did I see any hands up, thumbs up, or um, anybody want to unmute and ask their question directly? Uh, you're welcome to do so. Yeah. yeah, go ahead, please. You can talk, but you got to unmute yourself. <laughs> I can't read lips. I know. Olivia, well, I, I joined a little bit late. Um, unfortunately, I was working late, but the last bit I caught was really informative. I have Oliver. Ollie, here. This is Oliver. Oh, he's, he's beautiful. Thank you. He's six months old. And I was just wondering if you have any other um, tips for separation anxiety specifically I would say we try not to be overexcited when we greet him we try and do we did a lot of crate training at an early age um and right now we're trying to like and I didn't know what your thoughts on what your thoughts were for this but if we're outside doing yard work do tie outs work or do they just provide more anxiety for dogs when they see that you're 10 feet 15 feet away well, if the dog really wants to be close to you to take care of you, that probably would cause more anxiety. The, the, see, the, 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 the way to cure it is don't interact with your dog immediately prior to separation and go through the reuniting re, re, to, routine when you rejoin it. There is an article on my website on separation anxiety, which you are welcome to download for free. And I would be happy to discuss it with you. It's got, it tells you about separation anxiety and it's got some exercises in it that you can do. And two of them are very simple. Whenever you think of it, just stand up and then sit down, see if your dog reacts. You're gonna keep repeating that exercise until it no longer reacts. Then you're gonna stand up and go in another room without closing the door. So those are, and then come back. And you wanna get your dog to stop reacting to that. And then the third one is, is I, I, I'd wanna really, I don't wanna jump into it. Um, 
but it just takes time. But you need to do the rest of the leadership signals so you become the leader. See, the, if the dog is, if you're the leader, there cannot be separation anxiety because the dog doesn't think it has to go with you to take care of you. Okay, so it's a leadership yep. issue. Fear aggression is also a leadership issue. Dog, if, if, the, if you're the leader, the, the, the dog has fear aggression, it won't have it anymore. Because mm -hmm. you're the decision maker when it comes to handling dangers, not the dog. What else? Uh, other questions? Well, That's we, a great question. We we have a question in the chat, uh, um, Phil. Um, Janet has a dog that's terrified of the vet and so much that uh, she has to be muzzled there. That's the dog, not Janet. Um, sorry, Janet, I couldn't resist. <laughs> um, so she's 10 years old and we, we need to know how to help this, this, this dog. Yeah, the vet is a scary place to any dog. Now, now best because you know, there's different people there. There's, there's lots of other animals there. There's lots of smells, lots of noises that the dog doesn't you see. The dog doesn't understand the vet, doesn't understand our world. Plus it gets poked and gets shots and all that kind of thing. So it's a very scary place. Now think about this, the dog is probably petrified at the vet, but yet it thinks it's still responsible for you, taking care of you. So, um, you know, so that's, that's why, you know, it, there's no shame in having to muzzle the dog, but if you were the leader, it would, it would calm the dog a lot at the vet and if you stay calm. Because again, now you're, you're taking care of the dog, not the other way around. So that's, that, that can be helpful. The other thing too, is you can get to the vets early and do some stop, start, change direction outside. And then if the waiting room is big enough and there's not too much activity in it, you can keep doing it inside. I've even done it with my dog in the exam room because she's a small dog. To, to, you know, to bring her down so she's not so scared, but that's a, that's a scary place for dogs. Again, they don't understand our world. I mean, think about how uptight we get about going in for a procedure that maybe we've never had before and we understand our world. That makes a lot of sense. Does, um, thank you. Uh, oh, good, we've got another question. Um, this one came in through chat also. Two yep. dogs, 10 year old lab and a five year old hound and the lab has started um, to, well, we can all read this. Um, laying on the bed, intermittently moaning, ramping up to whining and then barking and there's nothing going on in the house. So the other dog isn't reacting to anything outside. So the, the, uh, the 10 year old is, I, what's going on with that 10 year old dog? Any, well, any ideas? <laughs> Well, it sounds like the dog, you know, I could be wrong about this, but it just sounds like the dog is trying to get attention. And if it gets attention by doing this, then it works. So it'll keep doing it. Is, is the dog healthy? Yeah, we've had him to the vet. Okay, so so what's the circumstances again? The dog lies where? He's, he's in the other room. He's either by himself or with my dog, my, my other dog. And... Uh, you know, life is carrying on and he's just sitting in there and, and he starts this hmm, hmm, and then whining and then ends up barking. So what do you do when he does that? Sometimes I ignore it. Sometimes I say, Sparta, what's going on? Well, you're and, rewarding it when you say, Sparta, what's going on? Yeah, he just walked into the room to hear his name. <laughs> See, in fact, in fact you're, you know, that's a good point because if your dog responds to its name, you don't want to casually say its name. You've got to, you, the only time you would say its name is when you want something from it. Yeah. Okay. I'm, I'm just, sure. Just, go ahead. It probably is that he wants attention because the, the hound mix that we have, uh, she's very dominant. And uh, I appreciate you talking with us tonight so I can be a little more assertive with her and be, be more the leader with her. Well, well, you can't change where the dogs are vis-a-vis -vis each other. They determine that themselves. The only thing you can change is where you are in the pack. Mm -hmm. And you wanna, be, you wanna be above the dogs so that, uh, how, many, how many humans are in the house? Uh, two humans. Okay, so you two humans wanna be above the two dogs in the pack. Oh, definitely, yeah. Okay, that's what it's about. 
Yep. And if the dog can get attention by whining and doing whatever while it's in another room, it's going to keep doing it because it works. Yeah. Okay. He needs, it doesn't he work. Needs they more stop attention. doing it. What? He needs more attention than what he's getting because ah. that, that blossom gets in the way. She's she's a, an attention hug. Well, that's because she's in charge. Mm -hmm. I'm the important one. I'm the important one around here. Why are you paying attention to that schlemiel? You're going to pay attention to me. Yeah, well, you just gave me more motivation to put her back down down on the ladder. Thank you. Well, you put her back down on the ladder by sending her leadership signals. Yep. Okay. Thank you. And by the way, once you you know when you're just hanging out with a dog, you can give it attention anytime you want because you don't need to reunite. The, the attention just has to be on your terms. You can give them as much as you want. Okay. So, um, uh, Phil, um, we've got another question here in the chat. Tammy wants to know about treats. So, um, if we're if they're using treats for training, is there an age or a time when the treats are no longer needed? What's your question? Well, I mean, you you, you can also use love and and uh, praise to reward a dog. I, it has really nothing to do with age. Um, it's just you know, it's it's like if you the dog will only perform for treats. That's telling you you use treats too frequently. And so then you kind of have to un, un, untrain that. And by the other, the other thing too, is if you know, if, if you act happy to see, so you got to motivate a dog to come to you. So if you're just kind of blase about, you know, hey, Poochie, come. That, what's that? That's not going to motivate the dog. You got to get a little bit excited. You know, it's like, Poochie, come, and then you clap your hands or you whistle or whatever, you know, you don't have to go nuts, but, but you want to get, you want to be, you know, you want to be fun to come to. So, but you get, but, and again, it's the same, you know, you practice indoors, say with recall, uh, at first more so than you do outdoors, because you got to fight all those distractions outdoors. But you can still practice outdoors too. Okay. I, I heard once from someone that you have to be the most exciting thing in your dog's life because, Absolute, absolutely. because yeah, th then that really helps. I mean, that establishes you probably that helps you be the leader of the pack right there. And then you've got the dog's attention for all the training and the learning that you want to impart. So again, again, it's all about how we interact with our dogs. That's where it's at. If you're, if it's not, if what you're doing is not working, you need to change your, how you interact. Mm -hmm. Somebody's waving at me here. Oh, sorry. That's okay. No, either that or they're just, it's just, it's just body language. Maybe, between. maybe it's the. Um, oh, it could be me. It could be. Okay. Steve, what do you have a question for us? We had a follow-up. I do have a question. Okay. Okay. All right. Phil, I'm Steve. My girlfriend is Olivia. She asked yep. you a question already. We have yep. Oliver, the GSP. Um, so my question for you is, when we go to eat dinner, yep. Oliver has a, he has a dedicated place in our dining room or kitchen area, you know, and you say Oliver place, he goes right to it. Good. He lays down, he knows what the place is so on and so forth if there's no treat he will quickly leave his place and try and you know do more begging for food you know people food or you know do more running around but if there's a treat and you say leave it he would stay for hours so my question for you i guess would be without the treat how would you get the dog to, you know, stay in his place without food motivation? Because that has been difficult for Olivia and myself. Well, I guess my question too is, we know he's food motivated and I always have food. As a dog owner, I know that's his trigger. So I always have the food, but I guess Steve wants to know, are there other alternatives that we should be exploring well the thing is if you give a dog food when it's seeking it it you think it thinks it's in charge of food you can't right. give a dog food when it's seeking it okay right that that's already a problem the other thing is 
the reason he, you know, he'll, he'll, I, if I understand the question correctly, the, yep. the reason he will keep pestering for it is because it works. Once he gets it, then he's a happy mm -hmm. camper, right? Yes. Yeah, basically. Yeah. So I, what I would do is, you know, if he's, if he's fussing like that and you can't get him to stop fussing, I'd put him in a timeout. You lose the pack. As Okay. Got it. Got it. Okay. So but you got to know how to do the timeout. Right. You're right. Right. Got it. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Yeah. Just whatever you do is don't give it to him. If you give in and give him attention for carrying on, he's going to keep carrying on. And see, that's oh, yeah, he another would... reason. See, this is another reason why, see, if the if you're the leaders, the dog would never bug you while you're eating because they don't right. the subordinate members don't bug the leaders while they're eating. My dog Got doesn't it. even stay in the kitchen. She won't go right. into the kitchen until I'm done eating. Okay. And then she comes in to see if I've been a slob and dropped something off the floor. <laughs> on the right. Floor. And you probably did that on purpose if you did it. Well, sometimes I do and sometimes I don't, but she doesn't know that. <laughs> right, right. I understand. Okay. But but that's, you know, but that, you know, and my picking up my plate and leaving the table is akin to the, you know, the 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 one above her in the pack who is leaving the kill. Right. So my leaving well, the table is a signal to her. It's her turn. So she's just reacting purely on instinct. Right. Well, I feel like sometimes the, in our situation, we live in a relatively small house and Olivia works from home. So sometimes he's let up on Olivia's desk, which is also our kitchen table. Oh so then when God. we're eating, so then when we're eating dinner, there's a confusion. He's like, oh, you're working. I can come up here. You know what I mean? That kind of thing. And it's so maybe it, but it might be some sort of a differentiating, you know, thing. But when we're eating, if you say Ollie plays, he goes to his place, but he doesn't really like to stay there too, too long unless there's a treat there. So yeah, well, that was well, as, soon, as soon as you say Ollie plays, you're paying attention to him. So you're already rewarding what you didn't want, even okay, though he goes in his place. What? Right. So he's right. got an association here. He knows the routine. They're very observant. They observe our routines. He's, he knows your routines better than you do. Uh, yeah, he probably so there does. He there he is right there licking on you, licking you on the face. He's showing you no respect. <laughs> right. He's asking for the last couple of potato chips, probably. Yeah. So, so I, I, know it's, I know it's nice to have a dog kiss us, but you do that by invitation. Like, give me a kiss, okay? Otherwise, right. he doesn't get in your space. That's that's invading their space. I'm glad he yeah, did that. I, I say that I I told you that we could not let the dog on the bed. That we couldn't <clears throat> pet him unless we initiated it. But when you get a puppy, it all goes to. I, I can tell. I I tell you something. I love my dog like crazy. It doesn't see this doesn't get in the way of loving the dog like crazy. You just got to do it on your terms. So so I I'm sorry to break a, break this up. But I know. I know. The, I'm looking at the I'm looking at the clock. I know. And we, I we see that we, we're starting to lose some of our our attendees because it's we've gone a little bit long. And okay. I want everyone to know that Phil is definitely available. So um, you know he's on the handouts. He's got his eight six zero six zero four zero nine nine six. His phone number and of course his website is philthedoglistener.com. dot com. Yes. So um, I, 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 you know, there's so much to learn. Oh my goodness. Um, yep. And and I, I think. Phil, I want to thank you so much, and I hope I didn't cut anybody else off that had questions. But I know it's getting it's getting later and later, and I um, I think all the handouts are helpful. Um, I really like that whole leadership signals piece. Um, there's a lot on there, and Phil, you're right. There's uh, trying to put four hours worth of information into ninety minutes is a, is a tough road to hoe. So. Um, I, I appreciate everyone's patience tonight. Um, it, this was um, fascinating and it really does bring home the point that we have to be more aware and not be giving inadvertent rewards or signals to our dog because their behavior is just represent representative of what we're doing you know we're not we're, we're sending the wrong signals so yes establishing um those behaviors so um it's 
it's fascinating. It's absolutely fascinating, but it makes so much sense when you liken it to the pack behavior. Um, dogs are not little bitty humans running around on four legs. They're something else. They evolved from a different, they evolved differently. So it, all the behavioral tips and pointers you gave us make a lot of sense. Um, so I, I just, I just want to thank everybody so much for coming. It's been a lot of fun. And Holly, you've been a, an amazing hostess. You really have. Great job. Thanks. I, I, I try. I try. But um, I, I want to I thank everyone else, too, for um, coming tonight. And Phil, I thank you for all, sharing all your knowledge. Um, you know, for those of you that also have cats as pets, we are featuring a um, another uh, Zoom presentation next Wednesday. So we can go over the cat behavioral issues too. And um, then we'll have our work cut out for us for the rest of the summer. So everyone, um, thank you for your questions. Thank you for sharing your evening with us. Very much appreciate that. And again, Phil, thank you so much for the handouts and the information and answering the questions. It was wonderful thank to you. have you. Yes, thank, thank you all you. very much. Great. Have, a, have a good evening. Thanks, you too. Bye-bye.